Yeah. Yeah. And talk out loud. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Levy Bates. Most people call me Love. You're welcome to do the same. I'm an astrologer here at Chicago Title. It's been 10 years that I've been in the industry. I can't believe I get to say that. <laughs> uh, I started off to fresh out of the Fresno State. I actually still was working on some classes when I started working here. And I got my degree in business finance. And Chicago Title has been the best thing that has ever happened to me. Because it's allowed for me to be able to also be an investor, which is what we're going to talk about today with investment properties. Um, feel free to ask any questions along the way while we're going through the presentation. I always love when the audience gets to interact as well. So straight your hand in and feel free to stop me if you have any questions. And um, we have quite a few things that we're going to go over today. We're going to cover uh, general guidelines when buying and selling um, any type of investment property. Um, title policies that will be available to your clients, some buying and selling tips, um, what to do when you have a property that has tenants, um, HOAs, and financing. So I'm going to start off, there's three general um, scenarios that we're going to run into whenever you have a sale transaction and you could have a potentially owner-occupied owner home that is being turned into investment property, investor to investor, or investor to owner occupied. Um, in scenario one, we are going to go through what happens in a transaction where it's an owner occupied property. So the seller actually lives in the home, it's their primary residence, and it's being sold over to an investor. And um, anytime an investor is purchasing a property, there is there's two types of title policies that are available to the clients. One is called a CLTA policy, and the other is an ALTA policy. We can make some more um, literature about the exact the difference between the two available. And um, an ALTA policy is only available though to people who are actually going to occupy the property. So it does have more coverages that are available when um, in the event of a title and term claim versus a CLT policy is only offered. Uh, there's specific requirements that the property has to meet and um, the owner of the property also has to be it, typically an investor, excuse me, when it's a CLT policy. Again, ALTA policies can only be issued whenever there is the owner of the property is going to actually occupy the property. The seller will sign an affidavit for us um, in the event that an ALTA policy is going to be issued. There are several requirements that have to be met, such as there can't have recently been construction on the property. Um, if there is a construction that has happened, there's additional requirements that we have in order for the company to feel comfortable with issuing that policy because it covers a lot more things, such as mechanics. Whereas on a CLTA policy, we're not necessarily going to cover those types of items because of the risk that may be associated. When there's an investor that's selling a property as well, I'll get to that one in a little bit more, but there's additional requirements that have to happen whenever we know that there's been construction or rehab completed on the property. Um, the seller can also potentially be subject to tax withholding whenever there is, excuse me, there, they won't be subject to tax withholding when it's an owner-occupied property because they may be able to qualify for one of the exemptions on California Form 593. So that's a tax form that gets signed on every single one of our transactions. There's a, a list of um, requirements that they have to meet in order to qualify as exempt on withholding. The standard one that most people end up marking is that they occupy the property uh, for two of the last um, five years. If they have not occupied the property at all, then the other exemption that they may be able to claim is that if the property is a loss or zero gain. Even if you are receiving proceeds from a transaction, it can still qualify as a loss or zero gain. And we always encourage the clients to talk to their CPAs whenever they're completing this form because uh, there's additional things that they can incorporate into their basis so that they could potentially claim a loss on the sale. So then they wouldn't have to pay taxes. 
And the other item is you can still um, mark an exemption that says that the property was your primary residence with disregard to the two-year rule. So there is a, a lot of people they'll ask, you know, am I going to have to pay taxes if I haven't occupied the property for two years? That is an exemption that is applicable and we wouldn't handle any tax holding through escrow. But again, everyone's tax situation is different. So Maybe afterwards they may have to pay taxes, but through escrow, we wouldn't collect anything because we would have that form marked with the exemption. The other item is that whenever you have an o, an investor purchasing a property, there's an additional type of policy that we can issue for investors, which is called a binder. A binder is where the clients can pay 10% of the owner's title policy. And so, for example, we'll make it simple. If the owner's title policy premium is $1,000, the clients can pay $100 through escrow and issue a binder for them. When they turn around to sell the property, if they bring the title portion of the escrow back to Chicago title, we will give them a credit for $1,000. So essentially, they're saving $900 on the title insurance. An interim binder is, uh, is valid for two years. The clients can um, extend the binder as well. It's an interim title policy. So technically, they, they are getting a temporary title policy, which is why we're able to offer them a discount on the policy. And then it gets converted into a true CLT or ALTA policy at the time of when they sell the property. The temporary title insurance. I have had clients there recently where we've had to go back and file a title claim and they had a binder. They did have to pay for a full premium, uh, for a full title policy in order to have their binder converted into a real policy so that they could file a title. So in the event that your clients ever run into that situation, you know, of course, direct them to us, but there are ways where they can, that's the only type of discount that we really offer to clients is when they purchase a binder policy, they get a credit when the um, escrow is brought back to Chicago title. Um, and it can be extended again for an additional two years. And I believe the cost for that is a hundred dollars. So, but double check with your escrow officer if any you can have that situation. So the next scenario we're going to go through is when the transfer of a property is being used as an investment property and it's being sold to another investor. In this situation as well, the clients will end up getting a CLT policy because they're not looking to occupy the property. And the seller may be subject to tax withholding because of the uh, it being an investment property, since they did not occupy the property, again, they may qualify for that exemption, that it's a loss or zero gain. They can also go the route of obtaining, of going through, excuse me, a 1031 exchange. Does anybody know what a 1031 exchange is? Okay, so a 1031 exchange is an intermediary company that will hold the funds after the sale of a property. They will then turn around and use those funds to purchase another property. So you're exchanging one like-kind property for another. So one investment property for another investment property. Um, I've spoken to several CPAs and they've indicated to me just because you, for example, buy a farm, if you sell a farm, do you have to buy another farm? And the answer has been no. You just have to buy a, another investment property. So you can exchange a residence for a commercial building if you needed to. Of course, all clients check with your CPAs and to confirm that that would be the case, but that's been my experience with the CPAs that I've discussed this with. And in the, if they, the clients will then have um, one, 45 days to identify a property that they're going to exchange into and 180 days to close escrow on that property. How many days? 180 days. The first one. 45 days to identify the property and 180 days to actually close escrow on that property. And it doesn't work with flips. Yes. It doesn't mean the properties that we've actually had rental. Yes, correct. And it has to be the same same amount that you sold, right? You have to buy the same amount or no? So that's where a CPA okay, would need to advise on, you do have to meet your cost basis. Um, 
So the actual amount that you have to spend is subjective. So okay. it, it varies from one person to another. Okay. And some people are willing to be taxed on a certain amount and invest the rest of the amount. And that's, again, the guidance of their CPA. Yeah. So clients can take, what Jennifer's referring to is, they call it boot, where you do take a portion of the proceeds. So let's say you're selling something for half a million dollars, you want to take $100,000, that $100,000 would be taxable income. So we would collect tax withholding, and there's two ways that the client can do it. In that case, it would be based on 3.33% of what they're taking. And when tax withholding is completed, there's the form is a little daunting. Well, I have a sample of the form in these slides. Um, but the clients can, there's different ways that they can opt to do the tax withholding. One is with the sales price method of 3.33%. The other is if they actually calculate their loss or zero gain, and it's based on 12.3% of the loss see, of the gain. Um, and then entities are taxed differently. Yeah. Um, in the event that you have tenants in the property, it's always best practice to let escrow know if there are going, if there are tenants in the properties and if the property is going to. Uh, be transferred over with the tenants in place. So in the event that the tenants are staying, we do like to see um, tenant estoppels or the, a copy of the lease agreement. So that way we can confirm what the rent and security deposit amounts are. We do have the ability to be able to transfer over um, deposits and prorate rent through escrow. And, and it's our preference, of course, to handle it for the clients. That way there's a, the accounting for it and it all happens through the transaction. In the event that the buyer is obtaining a loan, it's also necessary to give these numbers up front to, to the lender, that way they're aware as well. Another big topic too right now with um, the with properties is with insurance. So whether it's going to be an owner occupied and tenant occupied or vacant. You'll, especially for the clients that represent a lot of buyers, you want to get to, with the insurance agents right away because insurance in California has become very difficult to obtain. And I have a lot of clients who have, who are investor clients where it's difficult to obtain policies for properties that are going to be vacant. So encourage your clients to, you know, build that relationship with their insurance agents. And the moment that you get into escrow, you'll want to start working on the insurance policies because they can take some time. And um, some clients that I have, they have to go through the California Fair Plan, and that can take several weeks in order to get underwriting approval in order to be able to proceed. So just a mental note on that one. And um, this is an example on the slides here. It's an example of a tenant estoppel. If you have any questions about filling this out, of course, you can um, talk to your brokers, but it's pretty straightforward. The tenants do find this document as well, and, and then it's provided to escrow. We utilize this form as a way for us to be able to prorate the rents and verify what the security deposit may be or not be. And in the event that the clients can't obtain a tenant estoppel, it's not an escrow requirement of ours. We do have a rent statement that we can prepare to, and um, we get the rent statement signed regardless. If you provide the tenant stop, well, great. If not, then we can, we do have the ability to be able to prepare a statement for the clients to sign and agree upon with what the proration amounts will be and what security deposits are going to be transferred over. On our next um, scenario is the transfer of a property that has been used as an investment, but is intended to be occupied as um, an owner, as a primary residence. Excuse me. In these scenarios, we can issue an Alta homeowners policy, which is the policy that offers for title insurance coverages. Again, and that is because the property is um, going to be occupied by the new buyer. The seller may be subject to tax withholding in this situation. And one of the exemptions on the tax withholding form is if the um, seller is a partnership, a corporation, or an LLC, they are not required to do any tax withholding through escrow. The clients can would end up 
being taxed later on when they go to file their taxes um, the following year. But through escrow, we don't have to handle any taxes. And again, love it. It's been a flip. So somebody bought it, fixed it up, and now they're selling it to a happy homeowner. What are the construction type things that you're finding in escrow that can be a challenge for getting that all to homeowners issue? So one of the forms that we have signed through our transaction is an owner's affidavit. Within the owner's affidavit, the sellers are going to indicate to us if there's been any work performed on the property. So in these situations where there's a flip, we, the, the clients are, if it's been in the last four months, we would need to know what items were rehabbed on the home, the contractors that were worked with, where the materials came from, and a cost breakdown, budget, where the money came from. We also will require um, finance to make sure that the clients have enough money to have paid the contractors that were utilized on the project. And we will also go back and collect bill paid letters and indemnities from the contractors and any subcontractors. So in the event that there are there is rehab that is completed on the home, there are additional quote unquote new construction requirements that we do impose on the clients. And, and that is because we are issuing an Alta homeowners policy. So there's more risk that is associated for us when there has been construction completed on the project, on the home. Um, as an insurance company, we're insuring the title of the home. So, and our job is to assess the risk that is that comes along with providing that insurance. So if we are told that there has been um, construction on the property, we do want to go back and make sure that all of those contractors were paid and no mechanics didn't show up. Because part of an all-time homeowner's policy is that we are going to potentially cover the, any mechanics that arise. So, um, I have had it happen where at the very last day of closing escrow, we submit the file for reporting. And between the time of when the prelim, between when the preliminary title report was issued and when we were closing, a new lien came up. And we don't find out about those liens until we go and hit the submit button on our reporting. And unfortunately, we've had to pump the brakes when that tech stuff happens. And we have to stop and go back to the seller and um, whoever may have reported the mechanics lien and obtain releases, obtain the documentation that they were paid. And um, in that scenario, we end the, the sellers hadn't told us that there was construction. We don't really have a way of knowing if there is construction or not on a property, unless the clients tell us, or there are liens of record that will give us hints and clues as to the fact that something has been completed, that work has been completed on the property. Any questions about that? You said four months or something? Four months, yeah. Four months before? Um, so from the date of when escrow is opened, four months prior to that. Before four months back? Yes, four months back. If any work has been completed, we will want to know what work was completed and that it was tasteful. So if it was five months, six months before that, then we're okay. Yeah. Even that somebody submits a claim, I mean, on the kind of thing, so I don't know exactly what the time frame is as far as how long someone can take to report a mechanic pain. I imagine it's about the four months requirement because that's how far back we ask the I know, but if somebody uh, goes and submits a mechanic scene mm -hmm. afterwards, and you close this one up before they uh -huh. they do the that. So that's where a title claim would have to be filed. So in the event that something happens after the fact that we didn't pick up on and the clients can come to us and we would open a claim and the claims department you would- You mean the new owner? Yes, the new owner. Not, not the old owner. Right, so the new owner would have to file a claim under their title policy. So how long after you process to the title insurance hours and days? The title insurance is a one-time premium that gets paid, and it is valid for the entirety of you owning the property. Okay. Now, when something that comes up a lot lately for our clients is they will want to add people onto 
title after we possess room. So for example, if you are married and only the husband or the wife is going to go on title and they say later on, oh, well, no problem. We'll just add on the spouse after the fact. But when you do that, if you have, say you're buying property for $500,000, your title insurance is good for the sales price amount. So you have $500,000 worth of title insurance coverage. So in the event that there is a claim that has to be paid, the claim can cover up to $500,000. When you add so much title, you're giving away half of your title insurance policy. So if I add my spouse onto title, now my coverage amount is only $250,000 because I just added another person onto title. So anytime you have buyer's agents, especially, if you know that your clients are married, and even if only one person is gonna go on the loan, the lenders do have a way where they can add the other person as a non-borrowing spouse onto title. You always wanna take care of whoever the owners of the property are going to be, do it through escrow. Because when you do it through escrow, there's title insurance and all of those people are covered. If you do it after the fact, again, you're giving away a portion of your title policy. And as people add and subtract, there's less coverage that ends up being available because of the changes that are made. There is an endorsement though, right, Romy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yes. So one of the things that I've done this personally on several properties, I have title insurance. And when I purchase the property, it may be under my trust, or it may be later on after I close escrow, I set up an LLC. When there's an LLC that's set up, you can get coverage. You can't have your LLC um, be an additional insured. So there, I want to say the cost of that is one twenty five or two fifty. But there are ways where you can add on an additional person or entity to also be covered, so that you're not losing your title insurance. Okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. If the individual is on title, they have to have to have to wait. Okay. And this is later to add their spouse. Quarter million each or quarter million? Quarter million total. Because now the person who was covered, they had a half million dollar policy. But now you're adding someone else onto title, the value of that policy now has diminished because there's an additional person on title. So it was not vetted. By the okay. process of this escrow and the title insurance. Remember, Larry, process. your title insurance is from the day of close backwards. Now, when you add somebody forward, you've now changed your title policy, right? Does that make sense? I'm not seeing how if it was worth a half million today, in six months from now, the spouse is added, now it's only quarter million. Because half of that property just went to someone else, and that half interest is not insurable. For me, it's like if you're adding someone new, mm -hmm. that new person wasn't checked Correct. during the so during the process. So okay, so this this other you add your spouse, you're concerned that spouse may have a encumbrance that you did not check. Okay. Yes. Okay. So something else that I want to bring up when it comes to spouses. <laughs> <laughs> and next month's class is till death or divorce to us. <laughs> it is. So I'm going to touch on it just a little bit. Uh -huh. um, when you have, a, with actually any situation, when you have a buyer going on title, the, when I first started in this industry, every title company would run buyer names. What that means is we're checking for any liens or judgments against the person who's going into title. So if you have a federal tax lien, a state tax lien, and uh, you owe, uh, you have a judgment for any kind of creditor, credit card company, a bank, a vehicle, child support. Child support is a big one. When you are buying the property, we used to check, and then underwriting guidelines changed. Now we only check for what they call super liens or restitution. So, so you are in trouble with the United States District Attorney's Office. Um, that's really the only type of thing that we're checking for. Mm -hmm. it, and bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. 
in the event that you as a buyer have a lien against your property, we no longer require for that lien to have to be paid. We don't even check for the lien unless we're asked to do so. I have my name ran all the time, just in case if somebody happened to take my identity and use my social for something. So I regularly reach out to our customer service department and I ask them, hey, can you run my name to make sure that there's nothing out there? When I buy property, it's not gonna come up. The only time a lien is going to come up is when the property is sold. So as a consumer, when you, and if you have any liens against you, they're only gonna come up at the time of a sale, not on the purchase. If you have a spouse who has signed off on the property, you're taking title by yourself, and they have liens. The liens up until the date that that document was recorded, um, that date prior, those liens are technically still going to be your problem as the owner of the property when you go to sell the property. So let's say you're going through a divorce, and your spouse has signed off, but your spouse has millions of dollars worth of federal tax liens. When you go to sell the property, the title company is going to request a statement of information on your spouse, and they will check for liens from the date of recording of the interspousal back. We do, um, and those liens are typically good for about 10 years. So we will go back and check to see if there's any liens of record. If there are liens of record, even though the spouse is not on title and they signed an interspousal deed, those liens will be required to be paid. And on a refinance. Yes, refinance. Even if it's not on title anymore? Yep, even if they're not on title anymore. So they were on there for a hot minute. Mm -hmm. What if they divorce? It doesn't matter. Okay, what? Oh, yes. But so from the date of, so I have, honestly, it's like a personal situation. Yeah. So, okay, so I'm going through a divorce. The date is like, so he doesn't, he didn't have anything on there as of now, but I had him sign off on everything. And, but going forward, we can have a bunch of crap coming up. Mm -hmm. But I have our, our, um, the date of separation or divorce, the dissolution is until November, but the date of separation and the date that we, Dissolved everything was February 20th. Anything he had before is part of that, but anything going forward is not, right? Until you're actually officially divorced, his stuff is still your problem. So your divorce has to be finalized. And if you own any real property, you would want to make sure that he, even if he signs off, but you're still going to potentially run into, if there's any liens of record as of today, if you had him sign anything, sign off on any property today, and there's liens against his name, those liens will then be your problem. To have to deal with. Until that November, what well, right. is November 2nd. After November 2nd, anything that's recorded later, mm -hmm. that's his own problem. Yes, correct. But until then, because you're still legally married and California is a community property state, the whatever is his is yours, what's yours is his. So with a lot of clients that when they are going through a divorce and it's brought to our attention, this is a conversation that I have with a lot of people. And some pe I've had one client where she waited to purchase the property until her divorce was finalized because she didn't want to have to deal with her spouse's problems later on. In my opinion, and it may be an unpopular opinion, I think that this is a huge disservice to the clients. When you have liens, especially if you are married, you are buying a, a piece of property and the liens end up attaching and you have to deal with it later on. But this is how the industry works now, where all title companies practice this way, where the liens are, you can, you can ask us, are there any liens against me? And we'll do the extra searching for as an accommodation. But that question has to be asked of us. And we don't voluntarily go searching every single buyer name anymore because we don't run buyer names. The requirement is only that they liens have to be searched when the property is actually sold. But this was also inhibiting a lot of people from being able to purchase because the liens were being required to be paid. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. And having trust or living trust doesn't protect you from any reason. 
No, because your trust, you are still technically the beneficiary and you're the, it's the U.S. trust are interchangeable. So what would be a benefit when you put a U.S. trust or a trust? So with trusts that you end up avoiding probate when okay. Okay. So that's it. Yes, correct. Avoiding going to court. Yes, that's correct. it. Okay. Yes. And you're laying out your wishes ahead of time. Two. That's two for your... There may be. Um, everyone's situation is different when it comes to the tax advantages or potential disadvantages when I trust it. But lean-wise and core-wise, the, the only benefit is avoiding the profit with the trust. Yes, per se. Yeah. All right. And um, whenever the, going back to uh, whenever a property is being financed now, it's very important that invoices get submitted to the transaction um, as soon as possible. So that way we can make sure that our closing disclosure is correct. And those invoices will also give us an indication on if there's any work that's being completed. Remember, whenever there are things like roof or pest work that is being get, um, paid for through escrow, a lender will more than likely have a requirement um, to have a pest certification or a roof cert as well. Whenever. So be aware of when you're submitting these types of invoices to escrow. Whatever's being paid on, even if it's on the seller side, the buyer's lender does have to agree, uh, and they can question any invoices that are being paid through escrow. So, just something to be aware of. And um, what types of documents do we need to verify? Uh, whenever we have a seller who is an entity, so an LLC, a partnership, a corporation or a trust, and um, there's different types of requirements that we have. For every entity, there's um, a different word that's used for what their overall operating agreement might be. So an LLC, it would be an operating agreement. For a partnership, there's usually a partnership agreement. With trust, we would require to have the full trust agreement. Um, we only require the full trust agreement whenever the clients are deceased. So, for example, if my trust is, was selling a property my and I was no longer here, I was incapacitated, the title company would require to review the entire agreement to make sure who the successor trustee is that is to be signing on behalf of the trust. And I've had a lot of clients recently ask if they need to visit their attorneys to have a successor trustee appointed or if it can be handled through escrow. We do have the ability to be able to prepare the documents that a client would need. So if the, for example, if the trustor or the person who set up the trust, uh, the trustees of that, if they're deceased, then we can draft up the affidavit of death um, for the clients. They don't have to do that beforehand. We just need to be provided with the trust paperwork and the death certificate so that we can draft that document. In the event that someone is incapacitated, um, again, we have to review the trust and follow the guidelines that are outlined within the trust as to what is supposed to happen with the property um, and what's supposed to happen with the trustee. So if your trust says there's a requirement for three doctor's notes, then the successor trustee has the responsibility to obtain those doctor's notes for us before we can go changing who the trustee is. So going back to your question, like what's the benefit of having a trust? In the event that something happens, your wishes are already laid out for what the requirements are going to be in order for someone to be able to manage your assets that are held in title by the trust. Any questions about that? And um, getting these documents as soon as possible, of course, is the best practice. And with our clients, my team and I, we have a full a shared folder where whenever we get some LLC documents um, or trust documents from clients, especially if they're repeat clients, we save them so that we have access. And when you send it to us once, we try to not have to ask for it on every single transaction. So we do keep things on file um, and we do encourage the clients to let us know if there's any amendments to their um, entity documents that way we can keep records as current as possible. Um, with the with corporations and LLCs and partnerships, 
they are required to be registered with the most of them with the state of California, if you're a California entity. Um, if you set up a, if you or your client set up an entity outside of the state of California, we do request certificates of good standing. You are supposed to be in good standing in the state in which you have filed the LLC, as well as the, any state that you operate in. We don't require that you have, if you're selling a property in California, that you also file with the state of California. But if you are, for example, a Wyoming entity and you have filed in the state of California that you do business in California, you have to be in good standing in both states. In the event that you are not in good standing, you would need to punt, your clients would need to punt the state in order to bring themselves up to good standing. The only times that uh, an entity can go fall out of good standing is usually for failing to file their statement of information. Statement of information with the state of California, they just want to make sure who the and who the managers are of the entity, along with mailing addresses, and then they have filing fees. In California, the fee is eight hundred dollars a year, and they also have to make sure that they file their taxes appropriately. They, with California specifically, and um, they would work with the Secretary of State and Franchise Tax Board in order to make sure that they stay in good standing. Um, I just recently learned that my, uh, my attorney gave me this information. Uh, I have a trust, and they said that pretty soon here, the government is also going to require that trust be registered as well. So this is hopefully not in the near future, but it may be. Um, the trust will also have to show that they're in good standing with the state. So if you and have pay an annual fee. Yes, and pay, and pay an annual fee. I think most of it is so that they can track where money is coming and going, what assets are being held, um, but that is going to be a requirement here sometime where they, this trust ha also has to be registered. Um, with the state. And then at that point, I'm sure our company will require all the entity paperwork regardless, and we'll also want to see the certificate of good standing. All right, so other guidelines that um, we won't handle transactions in which they are self dealing. So you can't have a property in the name of your LLC and then try to sell it to yourself individually. That would be a transaction that would need to be handled. Um, but I don't know any companies that would handle that, but there might be one out there um, or with your attorney in the event that you're trying to transfer the property um, to yourself out of your LLC. <laughs> um, foreign sellers and foreign entities. Um, foreign entities still have to be registered with the state just like uh, California or any other state entity would need to be. In the event that your sellers are out of the country, um, permanently visiting, whatever it may be. If there are any documents that need to be signed, they do have to be signed with a US con at US Consul's office. Um, we have had lots of clients where this has happened, where they leave the country, no one tells us that they're leaving, and then they have to make an appointment at the consulate, consulates, depending on what country your clients may have gone to. It can take several weeks to get an appointment. Um, we've had lots of escrows get delayed in the, these situations because like, getting into the conflict can be a little bit difficult. And um, I've had some clients just cut their trip short and come back because it was going to take weeks before they would get to go to the consulate or the travel to the consulate was too far because they're not readily available necessarily. Um, but again, they have to be notarized in front of an officer at the U.S. consulate, and then those documents have to be shipped back to us. And um, there are ways where the clients can um, try to expedite that process. There's a document called an the seal that can be attached, but that document still has to go and follow through that process of going through the consulate uh, for that app seal. So. Do you have any foreign sellers that need their funds to be wired to foreign countries? And are there any special things about that? Yes. So I have had clients where they want the funds wired to, specifically in China is where um, a handful of our clients have been. And we can wire to a foreign bank. 
the um, banking, the wiring instructions are a little bit different. There's a SWIFT code that also gets included um, in the instructions. So as long as we have that SWIFT code, then we're able to wire. All right, and, and last part, confirming capacity. We do have to show on all of our documents what the signer's capacity is on behalf of the entity. So if you have a trust, you're signing as trustee, co-trustee, successor trustee. If you have an LLC, you're signing as managing member. If you have a corporation, you're signing as president, vice president, secretary. So we do need to know um, the capacity in which they are signing. With car contracts, there is a form called a representative capacity signature disclosure. So on that form, you're also going to be listing the capacity of your client and how they are going to be funded. Well, I mean, that's probably one of the most popular questions that I get asked is, what do you do with a trust signing or an LLC on a listing, right? Yes. I said, everything is whatever's on the ring, right? Yes. So if it's an LLC, it's listed by the LLC. If it's a trust, it's listed by the trust. And then that form should be used to figure the rest of it out. Correct? Yes, correct. And how often do people think that one person's signature is sufficient when in fact it is not? That happens quite a bit. And if you have that situation where only one person has signed, it can potentially pose a problem because you don't necessarily have a valid contract. The contract is only valid as long as all of the signatures that are required of that entity, if everyone is signing. So you can ask your clients for a copy of the paperwork um, to verify, but you're also more than welcome, and this is what I really encourage all clients to do, is when you have a situation where there's a trust or any type of entity and title, you can ask your clients to um, send you the paperwork or send it directly to us, and then we can verify for you who should truly be signing on behalf of the entity. And we'll review the paperwork. It's something that we do all the time so we can verify very easily for you who should be your signers. That way, from the moment that you're starting the listing, then your paperwork is correct and the appropriate people are signing. Now, in the event that you have an entity and like a, an LLC and there's several members of that LLC, not everyone has to sign. They can, even if the paperwork says that they are requiring all, all let's say there's five members and the paperwork says five, all that they're going to act in equal capacity and everyone's going to sign. They can prepare a resolution and appoint just one person to sign makes everybody's life a little bit easier. I prefer doing it that way too, so that there's less signatures, but whatever the clients want to do as far as signatures go, if they wish to just have one person appointed to sign, they can a resolution and our company will accept resolutions in which they agree that only one person is going to be signing. It typically only works on um, LLCs and corporations. In the event that there is a trust in title, a trust has to take title with trustees listed. So if you have, let's say myself and I have a co-trustee on my trust, if we're, both of our names are in title, we have to establish a record what's happened to the other person if one person is not going to be signing. So is there going to be a change of trustee affidavit? Is someone deceased? These are questions that we're going to ask. Even if trust papers say that only one person has to sign and they have the powers to be able to sign all documents on their own, but if, if two people are entitled, we would require both of them to sign. Again, it's because we have to establish a record what happened to the other person and why they're not signing. Okay. And this is more of a problem with the assessor's office because you're leaving someone's interest behind by not having everyone who's on title actually signed the paperwork. When you have an entity such as a corporation or an LLC, the signer's names don't appear before the entity. So that's why behind the scenes, you can change things a little bit and have a different person sign if your operating agreement um, or your bylaws state that you can make those changes. Okay. All right. Um, we talked about this on here. Uh, with partnerships, there's a couple different types of partnerships that um, can come up. One of them is limited partnerships. Um, 
In a limited partnership, there's two types of partners. There's a general partner. General partners are the ones that will handle the day-to-day -day and sign on behalf of the partnership. Limited partners are the people that are essentially financial people involved in the partnership. So they don't necessarily, we don't require for them to sign. And sometimes, depending on how a partnership agreement is written, they may, may need to consent to the transaction. We just follow whatever the agreement states. It's funny because I have a lot of clients, sometimes they'll get upset over the requirements that we have, but they're coming from their own documents. So, so if the partnership agreement says this is what we need in order to transfer a real property, that's what we're going to follow. Same thing with a trust. A trust will outline exactly what needs to happen in the event that someone passes away or there's a change of trustee affidavit that needs to be filed. We follow the wishes of whoever set up those agreements. Uh, so be it one doctor's note, two doctor's notes. And, and some people are very specific about what types of positions that need to be included when those notes are provided. And um, I have had situations where the partners have passed away. And in those scenarios, we've had to go through um, the clients. We went to the attorneys and uh, talked to them about probates. And um, there were documents that were prepared after their passing in order to address that their interest would have been transferred over to a trust or to someone else. As long as you have a paper trail and the documentation, um, there are ways that you can still provide title insurance for these types of um, This is a copy of that 590, really California Form 593 regarding the tax withholding. As you can see, it is kind of a daunting form. There's lots of questions and options, um, but we do help the clients with completing the forms. Uh, we'll ask them the questions, for example, like, uh, through insect part, I believe it's three or four. It has all of the questions that so we can ask of them as far as is the property your primary residence? Was it your primary residence for more than two years? Is it a loss or zero gain? Um, are it is a seller a corporation, LLC, partnership, an insurance company? And then the questions down at the bottom relate to if the clients are going to go through a 1031 exchange. On the, we also provide that up front for them to take to their CPA or they take it. Yes, absolutely. And the clients, even when they come in to sign, if they um, get confused while they're signing and want the advisement of their CPA, of course, we encourage them to take that with them and then bring it back to us at the time of closing. On the second page here, if the clients are um, stating that the property is a loss or zero gain, the previously, um, years ago, the state would just accept marking the box as loss or zero gain, but now they actually require for that second page to be completed in its entirety and for the clients to compute the loss or zero gain. So you have to show state how you're coming up with the fact that it's a loss or zero gain. And then on the third page, it helps with figuring out the computation of the tax withholding. So again, if you're going to use the sales price method it, and you're um, selling property individually, you can take 3.33% of the sales price set to calculate tax withholding. And if you want to do the alternative method of using your loss or zero gain, um, it's 12.3% of the, of the gain, excuse me, um, in order to come up with the tax withholding amount. Um, red flags that come up sometimes whenever we have transactions that involve entities. We do double check with the state of California to see if there's any changes that have recently been made. And um, so if, for example, someone has changed who the signer is of an LLC, uh, we will go back and question that a little bit, asking why the changes were made, especially if it's very close to when the transaction started. And we do our due diligence. Our job is to ensure the title of the home. And if there's anything that seems a little bit suspicious, you know, we're here to help protect all of the parties that are involved. And um, any transactions that regard you know, that involve self dealing, so again, that is where one at the principles of the transaction are all the same. So the seller is also the buyer. That's not something that you would necessarily ensure. Um, as far as 
The next one is um, any recent amendments to partnerships agreement, then adding or demuting people. If uh, we find that there are people that have recently been removed, we may also require their consent or confirmation that they actually removed themselves from the agreement. And this also really applies on title deeds as well and title transfers. If someone has removed themselves from title, we will go back and ask that person to sign an affidavit for us and confirming that they are not doing events, they understood that they were transferring the property and that they no longer have any interest. We will go back on any deed that has been handled outside of a title company without title insurance to verify that that person really did understand what they were doing. I recently had a transaction where there were three deeds that were done outside of a title company. And the transfers happened from a trust to a successor trustee and then to a random person. The, we asked for a copy of the trust paperwork. The trust paperwork did show the successor trustees, but it never mentioned what was to actually happen to this specific property. And with the specific property, uh, because it wasn't really mentioned in the trust, we went back to the successor trustees and we asked them to verify that they understood that the property was being distributed to this person at the end. And they said, yes, they signed trust or, a trust certification for me, confirming that they were trustee of the trust. Um, and then they provided a copy of the trust paperwork. Later on, I ended up getting a phone call from the HOA company, and they indicated to us that um, some of the deeds were done fraudulent, fraudulently. The client, the tenant in the property was trying to actually sell the property, and he had his friend forge the successor trustee's name on the documents. When the client came in, they actually came in to sign with me, and he, the gentleman didn't have any ID. So I had him sign the documents, but I told him that in order to appropriately notarize him, I would need him to come back in in person with his identification, and he never ended up coming in, which was, of course, the biggest red flag for me, right. and I told the girls, pump the brakes on this, we're not, like, really doing much or anything, but then, like, an hour later, the HOA company called us and said, where they started asking questions because the homeowner ended up finding out that the tenant had fraudulently transferred the property over to their individual name. Yeah. So did they get people to fake the successor trustee? Yes. Mm -hmm. A friend. With so much. Yeah. So in that situation, though, we... We obviously stopped and we needed to get a copy of the trust and because it was done outside of a title company and there was no indication that it was done by an attorney either. And uh, there was that uninsured deed where the transfer happened between the parties again outside of escrow and there was no relationship between the end person who ended up in title and the trust. When we questioned what's your relationship, he said, oh, I'm just a friend, which is fine. You can transfer your property to your to whoever you want to, you can give it to the neighbor or the mailman, but we still have to ask that question and find out why there were these transfers. So all of these things led up to, were just constant red flags. And so we of course resigned as the escrow holder and declined to insure the property. And next thing we're gonna talk about is assignments. So we have recently, we've seen a lot of these types of transactions where and someone will tie up a property for X amount of dollars. We'll use simple numbers here. So let's say you find a seller who's going to sell the property to you for $100,000. And people, that, a lot of times with these types of contracts, um, they'll use their own agreement for a sale by owner contract versus actually utilizing a car form. Car forms are used if there is realtors involved. You don't have to use a car form. and You can use your own contract. We have a lot of clients that don't even have a contract. They prefer we prepare escrow instructions and, and they'll come in, sit down with us, and give us the details of what they wish to accomplish and we prepare instructions accordingly to their desires. Um, 
for the most part, we're not including anything about contingencies, inspections, things like that. It's just very simple, straightforward instructions for us to utilize in order to help transfer the property. So when you have these for sale by owner contracts, uh, the clients can include verbiage in them about the contract being assignable. Our forms also has that. There's a form called an assignment of agreement addendum, an AOAA, in the event that the contract is going to be assigned or another party is going to be added on as a buyer. With for sale by owner contracts, we take the, uh, we take the contract and and um, we use escrow instructions to supplement the information that is included within the contract. When we get assignment agreements, that is where the buyer of, on the original contract is either assigning their entire interest in the contract to a different party, or they are looking to add another person on. So with a car form, again, if you have an AOAA that's going to be signed, there's two boxes that you can mark, either partial assignment or full assignment. Partial means that they are adding another buyer. Full assignment means they're swapping the buyer and they're replacing one person with another or one entity with another. When you have a spouse that's being on, added onto title uh, and you're using a car form, that's the best form to use because then you're showing that there's another person who's being added on the partial assignment. When there's a full assignment, the assignment agreement will indicate who the previous buyer was, who the next buyer is going to be, and a lot of these assignment agreements, they have a fee associated with them, especially amongst investors. So they can assign the contract for a fee. In escrow, when we have these types of um, assignments happen, we do have the seller sign a disclosure that they understand that the contract has been assigned. And within this disclosure, it does say that it may or may not be at a fee. We don't disclose the assignment fee to any uh, to the seller side of the transaction when it's a for sale by owner contract. When it's a car form on the AOAA, there is a spot there for the fee to be built in, and that does need to be built in when you're utilizing a car form. Um, but when clients are using their own for sale by owner contract, and um, they can have the assignment agreement just among themselves. So, when an assignment fee is paid on a transaction, we do issue a tax form. It's a 1099 miscellaneous form. And the signer of the agreement has to sign one form for us and agree for that 1099 to be issued to them the following year. Do you have any questions about assignments? Yes. So if I find a property, mm -hmm. I will talk to you. Mm -hmm. I convince the owner to find a potential buyer. Uh -huh. I come to you guys. And I give you the description of the property, and you guys prepare the assignment contract? No, we don't prepare the agreement. That The agreement has to be prepared outside of us. And so you give us the instruction. It can be a very simple instruction that just says, this is the assigner, this is the assignee, and this is the fee that they're paying. But you guys have the, the factory with the assignment contract. We have that? Um, no, that's not something that we provide to the clients. So we have to, you have to prepare, yes. We prepare an instruction in supplement to your assignment agreement in which we disclose to the seller this contract has been assigned and this is the assigner's information, this is the assignee, and then there's a blurb in there that says that. So I bring you the contract with the owner's signature. They don't have to come to title to sign here. No. Okay, they can sign it. At their house? Yes. And I bring it to you? Yes. Correct. And then the person that is buying the property from me, that's the person that comes to you to sign or not? Yes. yes. They sign, well, they'll sign our escrow paperwork. You can get the contract and the assignment agreement signed outside of us and, and just provide those documents to us. And the seller still has to sign the deed. Right. They still have to sign it. It's they not like sign. a quick claim deed or no? That's not a contract. It's a grant deed. It's a grant deed. Yes. In California, we utilize grant deeds to transfer ownership in a property. Quick claim deeds are meant to transfer potential interest that someone may have. So a quick claim deed is saying that you may have a possible interest in a property. You're not necessarily on title. If I sign off, I want only my wife to be on title. I want to be out of title. You would sign a grant deed right. or an interspousal deed. 
interspousal deeds are deeds where it's a transfer between spouses. And are the end buyers usually investors also, or are they people who intend to move into the property? I've seen a little bit of both. And most of the time, the when there's an assignment agreement, it is an investor purchasing a property. But a handful of times, I have seen a retail buyer who is willing to pay the purchase price plus the assignment fee in order to purchase the property. You, you mean a wholesaler? Yes. Um, so a wholesaler is who is making the arrangements between right. the owner of the principal. Yes, correct. Yeah, we're seeing those terms interchangeable, interchangeably a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Depending on the family All right. So special considerations on flips. And um, this is what we were talking about earlier when it comes to the quote unquote new construction requirements. When and when I say new construction, even when so when the property is built from the ground up, we have requirements of the builder, which is what we had discussed previously about them providing their cost breakdowns, financials, and indemnities, the bill paid letters, and then contractors and subcontractors to sign lien waivers for us, where they're confirming that they've been paid in full, and uh, they're waiving their rights to record any liens. Same thing applies, though, when it comes to properties that have been rehabbed recently, where we will, if there's extensive work that has been completed, there's a new roof that's been put on, or, um, you know, flooring, paint, framing, all these things that go into rehabbing a property, we want to make sure that everyone, that all the contractors have been paid, and we're minimizing our risk as a title insurance company as far as mechanics and being recorded. There is a 90-day flip rule, so anytime a buyer is going to obtain an FHA loan or any government loan, excuse me, um, there's, they have a requirement where this property can't be sold within 90 days of a transfer. I recently had an escrow in which the there was a husband and wife in title, and the husband was awarded the property through a divorce. Um, he came to me and asked about having a deed prepared. I let him know he had to go to his attorney to complete the deed and the transfer of the property. They get into escrow. And he's the only one in title, and uh, the buyer was getting an FHA loan. The FHA guidelines did not allow for him to sell the property for 90 days, even though the transfer was just between husband and wife. So any transfers that happen between the parties, uh, but even if it's you know two people in title or you transfer to an LLC, any type of conveyance will trigger that 90-day flip roll. So I unfortunately had to wait and re-sign the contract after 90 days. And um, something that I, a question that I get a lot when it comes to the 90-day flip roll, clients will get into escrow and then realize once escrow has been opened, there's a deposit, can, uh, and the 90-day flip roll applies. They will re-sign a new contract on day 91. And the question that comes up a lot is, do we have to cancel escrow and reopen? And the answer to that is no, we can still utilize the same escrow number. And um, usually the lender will require that a new deposit be brought in, which is no problem. We can refund the existing deposit um, at that time or at the close of escrow, but still utilize the same escrow number. So you don't have to necessarily start all over, but the contract does have to get re-signed on day 91 when the 98 foot rule um, applies. And then properties that have been acquired through a tax sale, those, along with any sheriff's deeds uh, and foreclosure, those are not transactions that have been insured. So there's additional risk that is involved. With tax sales especially, there's a redemption period where the property owner can come back and make appeals to claim the property back. So Chicago Title um, and our sister companies, Fidelity Tie Court Lawyers, our underwriting requirements are that we will not insure the property for five years. And even at the five-year mark, we have additional things that have to be provided in order for us to feel comfortable with insuring. There are other companies that will come uh, that will insure when the property has been purchased at a tax sale, and we can still help you as an escrow company. Um, we can open the escrow portion of the file here in our office, and then outsource the title portion to another company that can help with facilitating the transfer. 
when this is a question that comes up a lot for investors too is can if I purchase the binder policy at another company, can I still open the escrow with Chicago title? And the answer actually is yes. We can still handle your transaction. We in Southern California, you see this a lot where there's title companies and escrow companies. There are two separate companies that work together with us here in the Central Valley. We do title and escrow under the same roof. So you're primarily only working with your escrow officer. There are title officers as well, though, um, that work for our company. We're usually the point of contact for the title officer if there's any title questions, but they are also available as well for any title questions if you or the clients have any questions specifically. But going back to the binder though, you can open the escrow portion with us here at Chicago Title, and then we can open the title portion and request a title report from another company. So for example, if you have um, a title policy at WFG, they will allow for us to open a title only order so that they issue the title uh, report and they issue the final title premium. They are the ones that get paid the final title premiums. We're just making the escrow fee and any recording fees um, for the transaction of the, of the close. If the, some companies won't allow a title, title only, but you're always welcome to ask us if we can handle the escrow portion of your transaction. Um, and then we can check with the other title company to see if they will do a title only. Most companies will go. Okay. Um, appraisal, whenever you have a flip, appraisals and home inspection can also have additional considerations that they take uh, into account when they're preparing those reports. So, Oh, hey, well, quick question on that 90 day flip thing. Yes. Um, is it the 90 days they can sell it or enter into another contract until the 90 days is up, or you can't close the escrow within that 90 days? Um, so the 90 day flip rule applies for it's a lender requirement to, to where they can't start the escrow until the 90 days has. Uh, till day 91. Okay. We can close escrow. We don't have any requirements as far as how long you have to wait before you buy or sell a piece of property. The only time I have ever seen um, a, a blanking on the word here, a restriction as far as it goes, when you, how long you have to wait is with the 90 day flip rule, or if you buy a property from like HUD or the VA, if they're entitled, they will put a restriction as far as how long you have to wait before you sell it. And you can't sell it for a certain uh, amount above and beyond the purchase price that you paid. But those, it, those transactions are far and few between. So it's not something that you traditionally see, but outside of that, there's no requirements as far as how long you have to wait um, to be able to sell your property after you purchase. So there's, of course, tax consequences if you sell something too soon, but your clients would need to talk to the CPA about those tax implications. So on that, on that scenario where the people in Hawaii were divorced, he was awarded the property. So he had to, he had to go, he went to go get an epic tail on the buy off the property. And um, he was selling the property to a buyer who was obtaining an epic tail loan. Oh, okay. Yeah. And in that scenario, they had to wait then after the wife reported the deed to the husband and they had to wait 90 days from the date of that deed right. report. It's recording date, not signing date. And the deed can be signed prior, but if it doesn't get recorded and filed officially with the county records office, it doesn't go into effect. So they look at the recording date, not the signing date. And so with the same situation, if I buy a lot through the shares option, I have to wait five years in order for me to resell it. So with a sheriff's deed specifically, the I just had this scenario mm -hmm. yesterday. I have um a, a city around Fresno that acquired a piece of property where there's 80 lots and it's a subdivision. They are trying to sell the lots, but no title company is willing to insure the transactions with them because it was acquired through a sheriff's deed. And a sheriff's deed is one of those deeds where it has an unlimited time for the redemption rights. And so even if the city waives the redemption rights, the, we still don't feel comfortable with insuring it. And I checked with several other title companies to try to help this client as well. 
and uh, none of them were willing to insure. What has to happen in that situation is the clients have to go through an attorney to do a quiet title action. Quiet title action is where a judge will review the chain of title and then establish who the actual owner of record is. So with the client that I was talking about previously where the tenant fraudulently had those deeds recorded to transfer the property into their name, that the true owner of that property now has to hire an attorney and go through a quiet title claim and a quiet title action in order to have the property put back into their name, even though the deeds were done to them. And that, that applies when you buy at an auction? Yes, it applies at an auction as well. Auction. Yes, yes, an auction is not um, an insured transaction. It's the same with the tax. Sales for yeah. people is where I spot uh, you didn't pay property tax. Correct. And you buy it from the county, you still have to pay that normal. Yes. It's not like I buy a property today, I fix it, I wait 39 days, and I list it on the market, and I look for a buyer. Correct. All those have to pay five years. Correct. Uh, five years. You can try to sell it sooner, but that is the situation where you would have to, there's other, there's specific title companies that will ensure those types of transactions. Yeah. They are subject to underwriting review though. And so if you're trying to ensure before that five years, it can still be done. It's just not like you can necessarily come to Chicago title and say, okay, I want to sell this property. Chicago title won't provide the insurance for up for five years. And even after the five year mark, we still um, go back and we require additional documentation before we will actually make the decision on if we will ensure the transaction or not. So if I buy a house at auction, mm -hmm. the owner can still come back and claim it. There, so properties that are uh, sold at foreclosures, they have a period of uh, about 45 days after they are sold where and where another buyer can come along and try to make a bid on the property. So those buyers are can be either a nonprofit or a buyer that is looking to occupy the property. So it would be an owner occupant that is making the bid. They have it's either 10 or 15 days to submit a letter of intent that they are looking to purchase the property and that they are a buyer that meets the qualifications. And then they have 30 days to bring in the funds to be able to um, complete the purchase on a property that's being sold at auction. But the homeowner doesn't have a right of redemption on a foreclosure. Yeah. No, not just on a tax sale, yeah. a sheriff's sale, and all the other HOA things like that. So yeah. um, any other questions? Time. You probably need to move on. Okay. And <laughs> um, special consideration on properties with HOA, just something to keep in mind is that HOAs sometimes they have uh, restrictions on how many, what percentage of the property within the association can be used as investments. So if you have a client who's an investor looking to uh, rent out a property that has an HOA, they do need to check with the HOA to make sure that the HOA is not exceeding the amount of properties that are rentals. And um, they do want a certain percentage of them to be owner occupied versus them actually being a rental. So. And then guidelines for short-term rentals. Does anybody do Airbnb here? So with Airbnbs, there are restrictions that depending on the city that you're working in um, and additional guidelines that have to be followed. You do have to obtain a business license and then there's additional taxes that have to be paid to the city. Um, I've looked into personally purchasing property on the coast and like in Fismo, slow area, and they have uh, um, restrictions on how many uh, uh, Airbnbs that they will allow within their city. So uh, when you have a client that's looking to turn a home into an Airbnb, you do want to have them check with the city before they purchase the property because the city could turn it down. And then um, trailer item to go over supplemental property taxes. Whenever there's a change in ownership, the tax assessor's office will look at and change the tax bill based on the assessed value. Assessed value that you're utilizing is the purchase price. Supplemental taxes are a one-time tax that get um, issued to the clients. 
whenever a client has an impound or escrow account, yeah. the escrow account is only going to pay their secured bill. It doesn't pay supplemental bills. So, so we have disclosures that are signed at escrow and we do remind the clients that they may get a supplemental bill in the mail if they get any bills. And um, I always encourage the clients to please talk to your agents or call us and, and if you have any questions about any bills that you get in the mail and we can help direct as far as the, something that actually needs to be paid for if the income account is going to pay for them. And, and then financing statements on solar panels. So, that is a lien that will come up on the title report where the lien is technically associated just with the panels, but they do include the legal description of the property to show that the panels are located on this home. And the city of Fresno has requirements to register rentals as well um, with the local government. Of course, they want to collect their taxes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I every year I get a rent, a rent roll statement from the city where they want to know the contact information for my tenants, how much they're paying every year for as far as rent goes. Um, I think that's all that I put on the form, but it is required as a property owner if you have an investment property that you register with the city so that they know that it's a rental and it's not owner occupied. And on the trailing items, we call them trailing items because if the property is changing hands within a few months, these may not be current yet. And so you may get a surprise bill later um, just because it didn't exist on title or a record. When we were handling it, we got supplementals on something done for that closed, or, and it was from a year and a half ago. Right. So that person is in the room. Yeah. Yeah. The person that bought it. So this little slide just shows you that our Chicago oh, agents yeah. program can uh, handle a lot of different math when you're thinking about investments. <laughs> and now it's time for any other questions you might have for love. Yes. Sorry. Health policy is designed for owner occupants. Yes. It has more coverage than CSP. Yes. Christian says, when you buy that house, I'm going to be able to get some health policy. Absolutely. 